Okay, it's uh, it's two o'clock, so I'll begin. Uh, hello and welcome back, everyone, to this Archer Online NPI course. Um, today we're going to start off by talking about point-to-point um, -point communications. Uh, but first, what I wanted to do was just quickly run through the, um, the first exercise with you guys. So, <clears throat> and so one thing I should make clear as well. Uh, this this exercise sheet uh, that's been provided on the Arch Training page. Uh, this is actually the exercise sheet for our entire um, MSc course <laughs> on message passing programming. So don't feel you need to get through all of it. Um, and certainly in this first week, uh, all we're really looking for is for people to have a shot at number one. But they're just all on there. Um, but don't feel you need to, to bash through them all. Unless you want to, you're obviously completely welcome to as well. Um, but yeah, okay, I'm going to quickly uh, show you uh, one way of doing just this first bit. Um, if anyone had any problems doing this exercise, uh, do let me know as well in the, in the chat and we'll see what went wrong if I can. Um, and if not, I can try and do it later. Email. So, so I'm already logged into Cirrus. Um, And as I, because this is sort of essentially live coding, this is very light if you're wrong. Apologies in advance. Uh, so this is just the, uh, oh, I should say that as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to do it in C um, because that's the simplest for me. But whatever you choose to, to do this in is completely fine. Um, and this is just the example that was provided in MPP templates. Uh, and then the aim of this first exercise uh, is just to essentially split or fork based on the process ID uh, or the rank, the MPI rank of each process um, and see how that works. Uh, so I'm going to modify this well. So this is just a simple uh, hello world and it prints hello world on every rank if you run it across multiple ones, but um, I'm going to make it a little bit more sophisticated. Done that, adding that in because that was annoys me. Uh, so, oh, rank D. Uh, so, so far, oh. Just modifying our printf statement to include some new information. Uh, okay, so what we're what we're expecting this to do is for each rank to print hello world from rank my rank of however many there are in total. Uh, and the way we achieve that, what we need to declare some integers first to actually uh, fill out that rank and size value. Okay, and there's MPI com rank. Now, the first argument to this MPI function that we talked about last week is the communicator. Uh, we just use MPI com world, uh, which is the default all of the ranks communicator. You could also do something like um, MPI Com, at least in C. Uh, hopefully that's the right data type. Let me just check the ah, is that the icon? No, yeah, of course. There we go. Something like that. Um, or indeed that would also work fine. Um, but for now, I'm just going to put it directly into NPI com rank. Uh, so npi.com world, and then the address of an integer, which will be overwritten with the with the rank value. Um, now, this is mainly a, a foil of C. Um, then that's important. You might think it's okay to do something like that uh, and supply a pointer, and that will compile because it will um, meet the signature of the function. But uh, because that will be an uninitialized pointer, 
uh, it won't be pointing at any actual space, so you need into uh, malloc, um, some heat space of size one integer, or uh, pointed at an actual integer um, that's already been defined elsewhere in order to um, make that work. So the simplest thing to do is just to declare an integer and then supply its address. Um, that is that is just the C thing, really. But it's worth remembering. So it's quite common to for people to accidentally do that, uh, and that will not go well. Uh, but okay, and then the size uh, function is very similar in that it takes um, a communicator. And again, we'll just use a default. And the address of some integer to overwrite. Okay. Uh, and that should, <laughs> fingers crossed, if I haven't forgotten anything, be it. Um, so, what I haven't done yet is this load Intel. Oh, uh, made the fatal error of trying to tab complete this on Cirrus, and it always takes a little while. Um, apologies, I should have just typed that myself. What I get for being lazy. Yeah. <laughs> there we go, okay. That wasn't worth it. Right. Uh, not in PICC, is it? Yes, it is. Hmm. Got a feeling that I'm doing something wrong here, but, <laughs> but we'll find out uh, very shortly, I'm sure. Oh no, it's a good. Uh, yeah, I'm on the front end. It is MPI run. So let's try that on two first of all. <laughs> okay. So what I've done there. Him miss my new line. Okay, uh, and so there we can see hello world from rank one of two and hello world from rank zero of two. Uh, it's worth noting that these are not necessarily in the order you might expect them to be. Um, so, of course, there is no guarantee in MPI whatsoever that things will happen in a specific order unless you include synchronization explicitly. And it's even less likely <laughs> uh, when it comes to doing things like flushing standard out buffer that things will happen in order. And that can be kind of a pain, you know. Um, there are ways around it, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, hello, Marta, who's waving in the chat. Um, yeah, it's something to be aware of that, you know, the order of, of different processes is, is Never guaranteed. Um, okay, what we can do is for any number, I get exactly the same thing. So hopefully you all um, managed to get somewhere with that. That's okay. Do let me know if you did have any problems, um, either in the chat or by email, and I'll see if I can help. Uh, and with that, we'll get on to the first of uh, the lectures for this week. We're going to talk about the good stuff. Messages. Oh, that's not. Uh, there we go. I can learn how to use PowerPoint. Okay. So, messages in NPI. So, uh, a message in general contains some number of elements of some particular data type. Um, for that reason, uh, NPI defines its own set of data types. Um, and there are basic types, which are the sort of things you find in, in most languages. And there are derived types, which are essentially custom uh, data types. So, for example, in C, you could define your struct um, as a derived type uh, built up with basic types. Um, we're not going to cover that in this course, but there's a thing that can be done. Uh, and okay, the, the, the basic types are different uh, for C and Fortran for uh, obvious reasons. Um, so, one thing that's important is that it 
the message contains a number of elements of some particular data type. The, the reason you need to tell NPI what your data type is, um, is that there's no obvious way in, in either of the, or any of the languages that we're looking at at the moment um, to determine uh, what, how to interpret a message that's been received. Bear in mind, it's just a stream of bytes that gets transported between processes. Um, how to interpret that depends on, on what the data type is, um, and it needs to be told by the sender. Uh, the receiving node needs to be told by the, by the sender um, how to interpret it. And it does that by simply sending the data type as well, um, because I'll just receives a stream of bytes and has no idea what to do with it. Okay, so the basic data types in C are all of, you know, essentially all of the basic data types in C, but with MPI underscore in the front. Um, you know, how likely you are to use these is uh, correlates pretty strongly to how likely you are to use any of the um, basic types in C. So I would imagine ints and doubles possibly floats are quite common, uh, and the rest much less so. Um, car maybe as well. So uh, one thing as well that's sort of worth noting is there is an MPI byte uh, type which just says that don't bother trying to interpret it. It's just interpreted as a stream of bytes. Um, quite often people just use MPI car instead uh, because the character is one byte. Um, whether or not it's a good idea is um, depends on what you're sending, I guess. Um, but yeah, you can you can attempt to uh, recast the receive buffer at the other end to whatever after sending a set of bytes. Although obviously, if there was a data type, basic data type available, then it was a much better idea just to use that. Um, and in general, if you have your own data type, it's better just to use the MPI derived data types um, to create that instead. And that's a much cleaner way. Uh, it makes it much easier debugging. Than just sending around byte streams and hoping for the best. Um, so I probably would recommend against using MPI bytes unless you have some extremely good reason to think so. Um, but the, the point is, you need to tell MPI, okay, I'm sending five ints from wherever to wherever. Uh, and similarly, in Fortran, uh, it has its own set of basic data types. Um, and again, I would expect that. Double precision and integer are quite common. Uh, complex as well. Um, in fact, all these are slightly more likely. Uh, so Fortran programmers might note that um, MPI real is, or in fact, all of them really, uh, is a little bit vague a definition because kinds exist. Um, the MPI standard was written before <laughs> before kinds existed. Uh, but it does support that. Um, we're not going to go into it in this course particularly, but if you have a look around online, you can see how it deals uh, with kinds. But basically, the answer is that if you're using the default kinds, you're OK. Um, if you're using something a bit specialist, you'll probably need to create a derived data type uh, and there's support for, for doing all that sort of thing. Um, and otherwise, you just do what you would expect. Um, Okay, and obviously it's machine dependent as well to an extent. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, as ever, if you do have any questions, just just let us know in the chat. I'll try and respond, um, but don't be shy about it. So, point to point communications this is the most basic uh, communication mode uh, available, or form of communication available in, in MPI. On uh, also, the most commonly used is the, the simplest um, way of doing a lot of things. Now, uh, as you might expect, this is a communication explicitly between two processes. Um, some source process that sends a message to some destination process anywhere in the communicator. Uh, communication always takes place within the communicator. Uh, we are going to talk a bit in a little bit in the next lecture about defining different communicators. Um, the default one, of course, would always be MPI com world, um, which simply contains every rank that has been launched by the uh, MPI launcher. Um, or you can define your own communicators in our 
some good reasons for doing so. Uh, okay, but the destination process and the descending process is always identified by its rank in the communicator that you provide. So uh, you always have to provide communicator, even if it is just MPI Com World, uh, and that determines to which processes the rank that you provide uh, is associated. This may be different between different communicators. Um, so the rank is not a universal thing. It is specific to that communicator. Um, and you always have to explicitly provide a communicator in basically all MPI calls. OK, so the process is that a sender calls a send routine. Uh, they have to specify the data that is to be sent. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, it's, well, this is called the send buffer, and that's how we refer to it. Uh, this is essentially in, in C, at least a uh, memory address. Um, okay, with the start of your data, uh, whether it's a single integer or an array of them, or leading out data. Uh, the receiver calls a receive routine. Again, uh, specifying where the incoming data should be stored. We'll call that the receive buffer. And again, it's just a memory address. Now, you do need to make sure, um, we'll talk about this in more detail um, shortly, you do need to make sure that that receive buffer is large enough. Um, and it isn't just pointing at unanalyzed memory, or you will run into problems. Uh, now, as well as those things, um, so there's the place your data is coming from, and the send uh, point, and the place it's going, the receive point. As well as those things, the message also contains some metadata. Um, now, this you don't, as the programmer, you don't need to worry about that. Um, it's received into separate storage that's handled by MPI itself, by the MPI library, uh, and it's called the status. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why that's useful as well. Um, so the real focus of this, like, oh, in fact, of the next lecture actually, will be to talk in a lot of detail about communication modes. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna start that that journey here. Um, so MPI distinguishes between communication modes, which are synchronous and asynchronous. Um, okay, and communication forms, which are blocking and non-blocking. Um, hopefully, I've got that the right way around. <laughs> yes, I really have. So. These are slightly different concepts in MPI, um, and so we are going to go into a lot of detail. And later in the course, we'll discuss asynchronous sends, uh, or sorry, non-blocking sends. But for today, we're only going to be looking at blocking um, communications. Uh, what I mean by that is that the function will not return until the send buffer is available again for reuse. Uh, so it blocks the program on the process that's running it uh, until after the buffer can be safely freed or reused. Um, okay, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous communication. So there's a blocking and a non-blocking form of both. Um, and we're going to talk more about non-blocking later in the course, but now we're looking only at blocking, but synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous send is obviously the synchronous one, and it uh, only completes when the receive has completed. So it synchronizes your two processes involved in the point-to-point, -point, um, because one has to be at the receive, or has to have posted the receive uh, at the same time that the sender has posted its send, uh, whereas the buffered send is an asynchronous communication. Um, it immediately completes, or always completes, unless an error occurs. Uh, no matter what the receiver is doing, it just sends the message you throw out there. Um, so a synchronous send is like a, a phone call, where you know nothing happens until the other person picks up. Uh, whereas the buffered send is more like sending a letter, and you throw it in your post box and then carry on about your day. Uh, there is a thing, okay, and this is somewhat unfortunate. Um, there's a thing called a standard send that is either synchronous or buffered, okay, which is, is was meant as a convenience, um, but in my opinion is quite unhelpful. Um, and in fact, 
uh, not just my opinion, when I first <laughs> took this course myself many years ago, um, they've always recommended that you don't use um, MPI send, which is a standard send, uh, for reasons that I'll explain in more detail later. Uh, and actually, uh, although we're going to show it off a bit today, the same recommendation kind of holds for the buffered send um, for reasons that I'll, that I'll explain. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll, we'll consider receives. Receives are, are simple. They are, uh, again, we're only considering blocking them. And a receive is always synchronous. There is no asynchronous receive. Um, so when a processor posts its MPI receive, it will wait and it will not move on from that function call until it has received the message. Okay. Okay, so here's the, the kind of uh, calls for the various modes. The standard send, which is MPI underscore send. Um, don't use that. <laughs> the synchronous send, do you use that. That's an MPI S send. There's a buffered send, uh, which is asynchronous blocking, um, and MPI receive. Um, so send, S send, V send, and recover, receive. Okay, and the, the call names are the same in both languages. Um, the signatures are a little bit different uh, because in C, MPI defines its own data types, um, such as MPI com for the communicator. In Fortran, they're all just integers. And as ever, there's an I error, um, which you should always supply. Uh, the equivalent in C is the returned integer. Uh, just an error code, which you can choose to do something with or completely ignore as you see fit. Um, yeah. Okay, and so the the this type buff the Fortran that's obviously not a real um, a real uh, Fortran thing. Uh, the point is that in Fortran everything is um, passed by reference, not by value. So. Um, there's just pseudocode indicating that that can be of whatever type you like. Um, in MPI, we have to explicitly uh, include a pointer to whatever type we like. The call signature is just a void pointer um, to our buffer. Okay. So. <laughs> We're going to try a bit of interaction here. So if I want to send data from rank 1 to rank 3, and I write some code that looks a little bit like this, um, okay, can anyone tell me if this is going to do what I want it to do? I just want to send, uh, oh, let me go back a second. Uh, I should point out in these, um, in these call signatures, uh, so you have the buffer, which points to the memory that you want to send from, uh, or the send buffer, uh, the count, which is the number of data types, the data type, which specifies what data type, and from that, it can work out the size of the buffer that it's going to send along. Uh, and then there is an int, which is dest the destination rank, so it's just the, the rank of the, the destination process. Um, and then a tag, which we'll talk more about later and in the next lecture as well. But um, essentially, a tag is just any number, but it should match the receive uh, and the communicator. Um, OK. So here, then, this is me attempting to send data from rank 1 to rank 2. So uh, do people think that this, if the code looked a bit like this, it would work, ignoring all the things that are missing? Hopefully, just to, to bail into the chat and uh, make some suggestions. <laughs> and Connor J has has absolutely nailed it. Yes, uh, that's exactly what will happen. So, um, if you try to run code and look at it like this, it would deadlock. Um, for anyone, who, uh, ah, so uh, Alessandro was just asked. Does it work without the I error arguments? Uh, yes, because this is uh, C, C like code um, in Fortran, unless it's the 2008 interface. No, you would need to, to provide I error. 
Um, but because this is a C, it's just a return, um, and you don't need to do anything with that. Uh, but to go back, uh, yes, Common JS has got it completely correct. If you ran your code like this, every process would be trying to do a synchronous send um, to rank three, which is going to cause you a problem because that includes rank three itself. Um, so, and there's going to be no receive posted. Um, so this is deadlock. Uh, deadlock um, just looks like your code is hung forever. There is uh, Sheridan is asking if this would be flagged by a debugger. Um, if you have an MPI specific debugger, maybe. Probably not though is the answer. Um, I'm not sure how sophisticated the available tools are. I think there are. So if you look, you know, I've got a feeling that there is actually a um, some debuggers are able to do this, and we do have a few of the more sophisticated ones on on Archer, um, so they can examine the communication patterns. I think. However, uh, in as a general general rule, no. Um, because this this call is correct, okay, as so it won't be fact by the compiler, because the compiler will look at it and go, yeah, this all looks fine. So what will happen is you'll try and run your code, and it will simply pause because all well, because everybody will be waiting for rank three to post or receive, including rank three, um, and there's no timeout in MPI. It will just run forever. Um, you can implement timeouts of your own. It's horrible, doesn't really work too well. Um, so, so MPI just doesn't do it. It just relies on you on writing correct code. And that's part of why we strongly recommend, especially to begin with, that you write your code using synchronous sends, um, because it's more likely to throw up an issue like that. If your code works with synchronous sends, then it is correct. Um, as we'll see later on, um, that's not necessarily the case for asynchronous communications. Oh, <coughs> I jumped the gun a little bit there. Uh, so yes, this is highlighting the destination rank is three and the tag is zero. Um, so that's fine. And here's the answer uh, to how to get this to, to run as we would want. You have to fork it based on the rank uh, and say if rank equals one, okay, then perform the synchronous send. <laughs> yes. Uh, sure, and that's, that's correct. It is. I mean, it's unfortunate that there's not an easier way um, to debug MPI calls in terms of the communication patterns. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but rest assured, if you do have a code that deadlocks, you are far from the first, and certainly won't be the last person uh, that's had that, that issue. Um, and so, one thing uh, that we we'll point out here as well is. So there we're sending an array of 10 integers. So we saw we had kind equals 10 and data type is MPI int. Uh, if we want to send a scalar, we still just send, again, there we need to explicitly say the address of X. Um, that's, again, just a C thing. Uh, but count is just one. So it's as simple as that for sending a single value rather than an array. Um, and then the only other thing here is that, do we have that yet? No. Uh, that on rank three, we would need and if, no, no, we wouldn't. Yes, we would. <laughs> we would need an if rank equals three, uh, post an MPI receive for this to actually not deadlock. Um, and here's the, the Fortran equivalent, um, including the, the if check. And now you can see the, the I error um, argument is back. Okay, but otherwise, the, the principle is very much the same. Okay, and that would do, do just the same thing. OK. So for the receive, uh, the, the function signature is really quite similar. Uh, again, we have some, uh, some buffer that we receive into, um, a count, a data type, so that MPI can work out um, how many bytes it should be reading or writing, um, writing in this case. Uh, source. So you need to say, okay, I'm expecting a message from rank one or whoever. Uh, it should have this tag. Uh, it's all within this communicator. And then additionally, there's this MPI status, 
Um, so this is an array in Fortran of integers, I believe. Um, okay, and in C, it is an MPI underscore status data type, so it's a struct in fact. Um, now, you can choose to completely ignore the status and never do anything with it, that's fine. Um, it's more useful for blocking, uh, sorry, non blocking communications than it is blocking ones. Um, there are a couple of uses for it that we'll, we'll go into here, uh, possibly in the next lecture. Um, okay, but it does, it does need to be there regardless of whether or not you're going to use it. Um, so you can just declare a status, something or code, and then just provide that. And overwriting it is, is completely fine as well, especially if you're never going to look at it. So you don't need a different. Um, MPI status declared for each receive your posting. Um, it just needs to be some part of memory that's allocated to the right size that MPI can overwrite it. Um, okay. Now, so here we can look at receiving data from rank one on rank three. Uh, I can't remember what. Yeah, there we go. So again, uh, We've highlighted the source and the tag, so it's resource zero, so that's all good. Um, and there you can see as well, we've, we've created an MPI status, um, just at the top of our code that we can just override. Uh, and we're saying we're receiving into the buffer Y, which has been created large enough, 10 integers from rank one, tag zero. Um, and we need that if rank equals three to make sure that, again, our code doesn't deadlock. Uh, because then we got receive is another blocking function. So if the process goes into MPI receive and never receives a message that it's expecting, uh, it will just keep waiting forever and ever and ever until you kill the process and it did the entire MPI job. Um, again, very similar rules for receiving a single number. Um, however, one thing that's important to note here is what exactly the count means. So what, there is a subtle difference, okay, between the, the, the count that you send and the count that you receive, right? Um, so what do you think would happen? And again, feel free to just post this in the chat. Uh, what do you think would happen if, um, the, the message we received had more than 10 integers in it. So it was too large compared to the buffer we'd allocated. Any guesses? As a wise guess it truncated. That would be a, a sensible guess. Um, actually, what would generally happen, and it is implementation dependent, um, so you might be right, it could well just be truncated. It's more likely the MPI would actually abort with an error. Uh, you bring down the entire job. Um, quite often, it'll simply say, nope, something is wrong here and, and give up. Um, on the other hand, if it's if the message that's received is smaller than the buffer, that's completely okay. So in the, in the finest traditions of um, sort of statically allocated uh, languages, you can simply define a buffer that's much larger than you'll ever need and use a status to later determine how big it actually was. Um, but the point is that the the send, so equally when you're sending, the buffer that you're sending from can be much longer um, than the actual size of the message you send. If you just wanted to send the first 10 elements, for example, uh, of an array, you could do that simply by providing an address at the start of the array uh, and saying count equals 10, and it would just take the first 10. The fact that it's longer doesn't matter. Um, however, of course, if you if it's the other way around, if the, the buffer is short in your count, then you will say halt. Um, it will be bad. Uh, and the same at the receive end. So the receiving buffer can be larger, um, but it cannot be smaller than the message you receive, or you'll run into problems. Um, ideally, of course, those counts will always just match up. And so, uh, users just asked uh, for a bit more information on the tag. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking about it more a bit later on in the next lecture, but um, broadly speaking, it is a special identifier for uh, a particular message. So if 
say it's NPI receive is waiting for a message tagger zero. If a message arrives at a tag of one, uh, it will ignore that. It will not do anything with it. Um, it will continue waiting for a message to be sent with a tag of zero. So it's a way of matching up sends and receives. Um, whether or not that's important to you, it depends entirely on your use case. Uh, quite often it's not. Happy just to receive whatever message is being sent by the other process. And in that case, the best thing to do is just to say zero. Um, you can also wildcard it. We'll talk about that later. Uh, that has some drawbacks. Um, but hopefully that's, that's enough for now. And I promise there will be more discussion later on. Um, Martha's asking if your counter to receive is small than the counter to send. Buffer is large enough for it. Ah, I see. Um, no, your again, MPI will probably just abort. Um, so MPI believes you um, when you say how big the receive buffer is. Um, so it will not try and, and overwrite. Does the receive function allocate? No, no. So uh, Basil's asking if the receive function allocates physical memory in advance. It uh, very much does not. Um, you need to have allocated the, the correct size yourself. Um, and the NPI receive will believe you about whatever size. It won't try and go right more than that. Um, OK. Uh, but yeah, so you do need to either create on, on the stack of the heap enough space for the message you want to receive. Uh, and Josh is asking, does a mismatch of memory types uh, automatically cause an abort? No, actually, that will be OK. Um, and that would work fine, provided that the memory type that you said was larger, or rather the total buffer was larger. Um, <clears throat> so the, the basic point really is that what MPI does is sort of distinct from, from what else is going on in your code. So if, for example, you created an array of 10 integers, um, say you create an array of 10 floating point numbers in your code that was empty, you could receive what you told MPI was five doubles into that, and that would work out OK, um, because those things would have the same size. And then when your code came to interpret that, it would see it as a floating point array. Uh, MPI doesn't check the data types. It just uses it to work out how many bytes it should be writing. Um, that said, there is no benefit <laughs> to lying um, to MPI. So you can use this MPI byte. Uh, in fact, we'll pretty much do that. So there, instead of a count, you're essentially providing the raw size in bytes if you tell it to treat it as an MPI byte data type. It'll just go OK and assume that you've done the maths yourself. Um, and the buffer is large enough, uh, and all those things. Um, but there's no there's no benefit to you as a developer to to lying <laughs> to MPI like that uh, about what's going on. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, not even for for the allocations. The allocation should already have been done by the time MPI gets involved. It's simply for knowing how much to, to write, because you provide it just with some memory address. Um, OK, and then you know, saying 10 ints in, in C or Fortran isn't, well, 10 ints is, is, is meaningful. If you didn't have the integer or the, if you didn't have the data type there, just saying 10 it isn't really meaningful unless it's bytes explicitly. Um, because different data types have different sizes. And of course, you can could be a derived data type. Uh, so you could have an array of whatever size struct um, you've created for yourself. Um, so it's to allow MPI to do the math to work out, but it's not about to, to save fault. Um, but it's the, the memory allocation should already have happened elsewhere in the code. MPI will not do that for you. OK, great. Um, so this is MPI receives, um, buffer count, data type, source tag, communicator status in C, um, and in Fortran, it's that, but with an IR on the end um, for good measure. 
Okay, and here you can see the status is defined as an integer array of dimension MPI status size, which is a convenience um, definition for you. So you don't have to worry about how big that is, just MPI status size. Um, okay. So then the synchronous blocking message passing, so the SNs. Um, as mentioned before, the process is synchronized. And what I mean by that is you can tell that you're sending receiving processes, or at least you know what point they're at in the code because one is posted to send and one is posted to receive, and neither will be past that point until they're both there. Okay, until the received is completed, they're both going to sit in that function and wait. And if you know if one of this end is missing, then they will sit and wait forever, and a code will deadlock, and, and there is no timeout. Okay, it will just wait forever. Um, if you're running on something like Arch or Sirius, it will run until the wall time that you specified is passed, and then your job will get killed. And both processes wait until the transaction is completed, so it blocks. <clears throat> okay, so we've already said all this, but uh, for the communication to succeed, the sender must specify a valid destination rank. Okay, so you can't say, uh, yes, send this to rank 100, when you've only launched four processes, that will fail. Uh, equally, the receiver must specify a valid source rank. Um, the indexing of, of rank starts at zero, um, as is right and proper if you're a C programmer. <laughs> um, uh, okay, and it's always positive. There's no negative ranks or anything like that. Um, just an index from zero, uh, positive integer list. The communicators have to be the same, um, so that's an important point because uh, ranks are not the same across communicators. Okay, so every communicator has its own list of ranks for individual processes. Um, it's only meaningful if the the ranks match within that communicator. If the communicators are different, um, then the rank means nothing. And, there's no way, and also, so there's no communication between communicators, in fact. Um, so the communicator must be the same for these point to point communications. The tags must match. As I said that's, that's an, just another way of matching messages. Um, the message types must match. Oh, okay, so apparently I was wrong about that. You can't get away. Um, apologies, you can't get away with lying. <laughs> To MPI, that's that's for the best, I think. Um, okay, and the receiver's buffer must be large enough, as we discussed. Okay, that's, that's important. You, the only way that you can um, essentially get MPI to ignore the MPI data type uh, is by using MPI byte, and there it will just say, "Okay, I'm looking for this many bytes." Um, uh, so the receiver can be wildcarded. Okay, wildcard. So you can say uh, MPI any source to receive from any other rank. Um, and you can say MPI any tag to receive with any tag. Uh, it's, so it's better just to use these things if you absolutely have to. It's always more efficient. Um, if you can specify these things and safer you know, in terms of making sure that your code is correct, there are good reasons to use MPI any source. Um, however, if it's just because your code is deadlocking and then when you put MPI any source, it doesn't deadlock anymore, uh, that means that your code is not incorrect but could be reordered to make that not necessary in all likelihood. Um, so it's better to do that than to wildcard it. Uh, equally, the MPI any tag there, I mean, it seems like it might be the obvious thing to do because if you just don't care about the tags, you're not using them for anything. Um, then, okay, why not just do MPI any tag? Uh, that's fine, except that that's just a little bit slower <laughs> if you do that. So if you just set it as zero, if you don't care, that's more efficient uh, and that's use essentially the same effect. Um, okay, in the actual source and tag, so if wildcard you can check the actual source and check the actual tag uh, by examining the status parameter to say and see that's a struct um, in Fortran it is an integer array okay and this metadata is, is kind of like the, the envelope 
um, in which the message is contained. Okay. Rather the, the kind of send and receive functions that contain all of the information. Um, then an envelope would, if you are sending a letter, just like they did in the olden days. <laughs> okay, so it has the sender's address, uh, who it's for. Okay, and it contains data. Uh, this envelope information is returned as a status and includes the source, the tag, and the count. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are received buffer, uh, Matt is asking why you would use wildcards. Um, if you, so it's really more for synchronous communication, you pro, well, for synchronous blocking, yeah. Uh, so Mara's just said, it seems like high risk you run for an error. And that is absolutely correct, which is why we recommend you don't. Um, however, there are reasons why you might, if you're doing uh, more, um, well, if you have a more complex communication pattern, which is not necessarily predictable uh, in the same way at a certain point in your code, or indeed, um, if you're doing non-blocking communications. Um, so it might be, for example, you have uh, a controller worker type pattern where the controller is just waiting um, and it's like a task farm, say, uh, and the controller is just waiting to hear that a task has been completed before it sends another one out to any given process. There you would just have post to receive um, that said, okay, I don't mind where it comes from, but when that happens, do this. Um, so that might be an instance where you would need to wildcard it. But you're right, it's always better if you can avoid it to, to not use wildcards. Okay, it's just a better idea. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of things that MPI will let you do, um, but for the most part, you shouldn't. <laughs> um, because it's, it's designed to be very flexible. Um, and then what's happened over time as well is that uh, obviously new functionality has been added as new cases and uh, new use cases have been discovered. Um, but also you'll find that the things that are more commonly used are the things that the MPI forum focuses on improving. Um, so if you, so another thing is that if you're using a sort of more niche feature of MPI, uh, it's less likely well supported um, and well optimized. Um, so, you know, if you stick to sort of the mainstream things, those are where you get the best performance out. Um, whether that's a good or a bad thing, I can't really say, but uh, it's sort of the way it is. Um, okay, yeah. uh, so, so as I mentioned earlier, it's quite a right to create a receive buffer that's larger. Um, and then you can get the real number of things that have arrived from uh, uh, using MPI get count. Uh, and then supplying the status. And um, that relies on the count that the sender specified. So obviously, if the sender is live, then you're still in trouble. <laughs> Although they can't, in fact, because it will just read that number of not that much memory in. So that's OK. Um, yeah, so the, the, the message count, uh, again, MPI get count in C. Um, and you need to supply the status uh, for the message, uh, the base type, and then a integer address, which can be overridden, uh, and the Fortran call over. Okay, and this will tell you the real number of things that have arrived. Uh, so Chris Stewart is asking, what is the difference between the outcome of MPI get count uh, and status dot count? Let me go back and see if we actually. So I can't find the actual makeup of a, an MPI status struct. I suspect that's not available. Um, the important point, though, is that MPI get count relies on the data type. Ah, yes. OK, so that's a good point. Yeah. So Chris has said, is it byte count versus data count? Uh, the answer would be yes. <laughs> so if there is a status dot count, uh, which I suspect there probably is, um, that will be the difference, is it will just be the raw byte count um, and an MPI get count uses the data set you provide it to tell you how many whatever's um, yeah well spotted 
Ooh. Oh, the Microsoft Docs and MPI. Amazing. Yeah, there you go. I'll thank you for that link. <laughs> so whenever I uh, end up looking at things, I end up looking at the MPitch, which is the MPI CH, um, one of the various uh, library vendors, uh, and their, their documentation is quite terse. <laughs> um, but yeah. Almost certainly it's just raw byte count that's included in the status. Uh, and an MPI get count the function, we use that plus a data type that you provide um, to give you more useful information. Okay, so another important uh, MPI feature, uh, which is one of the things from the standard, uh, is message order preservation. So messages do not overtake each other, uh, even for non synchronous sends. Um, however, there's an important caveat to that. Um, this is only true between the same two processes. So other stuff going on in a network, um, you know, is not anything can happen. But for any two processes, messages between them will never overtake one another. Um, okay, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous. <clears throat> okay, and so this. It means that if we look at some examples of message matching, so here we have a synchronous send, um, or in fact, rank zero is sending two messages synchronously uh, to rank one, okay, with a tag one and a tag two. Uh, and meanwhile, rank one has posted two receives into buffer one and buffer two, both to rank zero with tag one and tag two. Uh, and this, this will be fine, okay, because the first synchronous send is posted, the first receive is posted, they match up because they have the right source and the right destination. Um, and we're assuming that the data type information and buffer sizes are all correct. Okay, and they have the same tags, so they will match. Uh, that S send and that receive will complete. And then the second S send and the second receive will be posted. Um, and they will both complete successfully. Everything's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Option two. This code. This code will deadlock. Okay, and it'll deadlock because the synchronous send from rank zero has tag equals one, and the first receive that's posted will have tag equals two. Uh, now, because these are synchronous, it, it's obvious. Okay, that. Um, Both of these will never complete. Okay, so it doesn't matter that the next one has the correct tag because uh, it's never going to come out of that first receive. It'll just be waiting forever for a tag equals one message to arrive. No, sorry, a tag equals two message to arrive. Uh, and it will completely ignore the tag equals one. Uh, say, okay, I haven't posted a receive for this, so whatever. Um, meanwhile, the first synchronous send will never complete because it hasn't been received. So this code will deadlock. Okay, uh, the, the solution to this deadlock is, of course, just to reverse the order of one of them. Uh, it doesn't matter which, um, which is why we say that synchronous sends help you get correct code. Uh, and that creates a better starting place. Okay. But as I say, in the next lecture, we'll be going into more detail on sending modes. <coughs> um, so really plenty of um, <laughs> discussion of the relative benefits of buffered sends at that point. Um, message matching three. Okay, so here we have an asynchronous buffered send um, where the tags match. Okay, the both just tag equals one. Um, so any ideas how this one would work out? Um, so say we'll talk about more about what exactly a buffered send is later, but for now, how we need to know is it's asynchronous. Um, it would ascend and then, and then return immediately, whether or not a receive has been completed. Um, so does anyone have any ideas uh, whether or not this one will be okay? Yep, so Basil White says it looks fine, and I am in agreement. Um, 
So the messages have the same tags, and what's key here is that they're matched in order. So that's that's the, the tiebreaker here is the order in which they arrive. So message one uh, is received into buff one, and message two is received into buff two. Okay, but this code will happily run with no deadlock. Uh, everything's fine and dandy. Um, note, of course, that okay, the second piece end will probably have begun before the first receive, or may have begun before the first receive um, has completed, and that's fine in this case because it's an asynchronous end. Um, how about this one? This is asynchronous sends. Tag equals one. Tag equals two. Alessandro, so this should be okay too. And they are correct. This one will also be fine. Uh, however, okay, what's different here is that because uh, the first beat end is sending with tag equals one, um, that will not be received until after the second message has been sent. And that will happen in this case because it's a beat end. Um, so tag equals two gets sent, and message two is received into buff two. Okay. Uh, and that's the first thing that happens at rank one. Um, it will ignore the presence of the tag equals one message until that second receive is, is posted, and then it will receive message one into buff one. Okay, so you can use tags if you're using your synchronous sends to match up um, particular uh, messages or particular sends, with particular receives, uh, and indeed that's probably desirable um, if you are using asynchronous sends um, because it helps you to know what exactly you've just received, right? If you're writing all this code. Um, however, the thing to know is that. Uh, there's no real advantage to doing it this way around. Okay, so, um, okay, well, no, I'll save it for the next lecture. I'll not <laughs> start logging into vSEN just yet. Um, okay, but here this will be fine, but just it's matched on tags, not on order, uh, but they still don't overtake each other, even though they're asynchronous. Uh, it's just that the receives um, are posted out of order compared to the sends. Uh, but here that doesn't deadlock. Um, but just switching to asynchronous communications is not a good way out of a deadlock. Um, writing your code correctly is a good way out of a deadlock. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, what about here? So what, where do we think uh, various messages will, will end up in this situation? Uh, <laughs> several guesses there. Um, so actually, Chris Chris Stewart has it correct. Um, so here, okay, message one will be received into buffer one, uh, and message two will be received into buffer two because they don't overtake one another. Um, but you're right; it's you have to know that by looking at the code in this way. Uh, there's nothing programmatic that will tell you that. You'd have to check the status um, to find out the actual tagged values. Um, however, they are guaranteed to match and send order. Um, <laughs> Alessandro is asking if I would have a code like this last example. Uh, I sincerely hope not, <laughs> Alessandro. Um, Marta is asking where the previous one worked. Uh, so uh, this one worked, Marta, because um, B send is asynchronous, so it doesn't block. It sends and then it moves on immediately. Um, we'll go into more detail about what it actually does uh, in the next lecture. But for now, it's enough to know that it sort of returns straight away without waiting for the receive to complete. And that means that the second message is also sent. Okay. And then once the second message has been sent, the first receive can complete. Ah, so yes, it's correct. They don't overtake. Uh, so message one arrives at rank one first, but nothing happens to it. Uh, so this will become a bit clearer in the next lecture, I promise, when we look at what BSEND actually does. Um, 
But here, did this career would work correctly because uh, the second send is able to happen. Uh, here, that's saying the meta call, which presumably had overlapping messages in case tag equals any, was implemented using standard send. Um, so the standard send is basically either synchronous or buffered. Um, yeah, so there, there anything could happen. Uh, again, this is pretty much the focus of the next lecture. Uh, we strongly recommend against using standard send for that exact reason. Um, yes, because you'd have to check what the tag was if it's been wildcarded um, and they're using standard sends because then, yeah. Um, so Martin's asking if the, the receiver's reading messages into a buffer rather than actually receiving them. Um, kind of. Yeah, so there is there is an seven nine. However, okay, so what the buffered send is actually doing, I might as well uh, say this now. The buffered send either um, sends synchronously, or if there is enough room in the local buffer, copies into that buffer. So what is uh, special about the buffered send is that it makes the send buffer reusable straight away okay so you can overwrite or free message one and that's fine but it doesn't mean the message is actually sent uh, it may have just copied it into its own buffer space or a buffer space that you have provided um, we'll talk about uh, in a bit but it means that message one is reusable straight away um, but it doesn't actually mean that it's gone anywhere because it's not a synchronous send um, so what will actually happen is that there is some amount of communication between MPI processes uh, that MPI does for you. Um, so the buffer send will work out that there is no receive yet, and it will just hold on to that message until it's told that it can send it to to other similar to receive it on rank one. Um, it's a uh, it's a slightly messy situation. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully that clears it up a bit. But as they would, pretty much the next lecture is is mostly about exactly this sort of issue. Um, so Alessandro's asked uh, which one is more efficient between a send and B send. Um, well, for that reason, because because B send takes a copy, um, S send. Okay, and Marta's answering more questions for the, for the next lecture. But yeah, so for Alessandro's question, uh, which is more efficient, S send simply because it doesn't copy the data uh, into another buffer. Um, it would send from the buffer you provide it because it knows that you know there had better be a receive, or there will be soon. So there, MPI probably will buffer the message in its own local memory until. Um, uh, until that receiver arrives, if they don't have, if the receiver hasn't already been posted. Um, uh, Joss is asking if it's possible to have BSENs piling up in buffers for every, uh, forever if the receiving rank doesn't get what it's looking for. Uh, Josh has already hit upon one of the major issues with BSEND. Uh, it will pile up in the buffer until you run out of buffer space and then it will crash your entire program. <laughs> so I think that this, we're now fully loaded with all the spoilers for the next lecture. Um, yeah, that's why we say B sends are bad um, and standard sends are bad because they might be a B send. Uh, it is possible um, to have code that runs correctly in one place and not in another that way because buffer sizes can differ, um, communication patterns differ on different machines for reasons that we'll go into. But essentially, yeah, you can um, just keep shoving these ends in until the buffer is full, uh, and then everything will, will go down, uh, which is quite unpleasant. So S ends are much safer. Um, and if you actually want, so the reason that asynchronous communication is good is it lets you overlap communication and computation. And actually, there is a set of non-blocking communications that do a much better job of that. 
um, which we'll be discussing next week, I think, or the week after. Uh, Buzz is asking if you can add code to clear the message buffer. Um, no, because um, it's sort of an internal thing to MPI. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, you would be, it's never a good idea to remove messages, right? Because then, you know, at some point, you assume that a receive will be posted for any given message or what was the point in sending it. Um, and it will never arrive if you've already cleared it away. Um, and it's not a great idea just to fling a message at another process in the hopes that a buffer will appear um, for similar problems if you end up just piling stuff into some unknown buffer. Uh, yes, bsend is, is a synchronous, always. Um, Josh is asking if the buffer memory is protected or can a rank access its own buffer. Uh, no, not, or at least the, the developer can't. Um, so it's it's allocated. So basically there's a, I'll see this in the next lecture, there's a buffer attach uh, function that you call where you say you create, you allocate some space uh, and then you provide it to MPI and say, okay, shove the messages here. Uh, and if it's large enough, that's great. If it's not, then you're in trouble. Okay, but you can't, you shouldn't do anything with it um, except through MPI after you've, you've provided it. Um, okay, so, <laughs> yes, so this one we looked at with the, the wildcard uh, tagging, and here they will just be uh, receiving order. So buffer one gets message one, and buffer two gets message two, uh, and you can check the status to find out the actual tag values in order to determine what is likely to be in buffer one and buffer two. Um, okay, if receive matches multiple messages in the inbox, um, then the messages will be received in the order they were sent. And this is only relevant for multiple messages from the same source because message order is not preserved um, across the network. It's just between two particular points. Okay. That's it for now. We'll come back at half three. Uh, I'm going to go and get another coffee. Um, and then at half three, I will quickly introduce calculation of pi, and then we will launch into the next lecture, which is on communicators, tags, and modes. Um, and we'll in a great deal of um, saying that B sends are bad. <laughs> OK, so um, welcome back. I hope everyone's had a chance to Go to Lou and get more caffeine. Um, so I'm not going to say you're welcome to do the exercises at any time you like. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce exercise to you right now, and then we'll move on with the lecture. Um, so exercise two is a calculation or of approximate value for pi. Um, and the point is this time we're moving one step up and you'll need to actually use point-to-point -point communications um, to calculate this. Uh, you can find the exercise sheet on the main uh, online MPI training page. Uh, it's linked from there. And actually, as, as I mentioned earlier, it has all of the exercises for our entire um, message passing programming MSC course on it. Uh, you're welcome to try as many or as few as you like. Um, if you're keeping pace with this, Ah, Claire has linked it. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, if you're keeping pace with this, then the next one to try is exercise two. Um, a couple of uh, small pointers to get you started. Uh, the value of n in the expansion of pi is not the same as the number of processes. Uh, in fact, it might be more useful for me to show you the actual um, equation right now. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that value of n is not the same as the number of processes. It is just a large number. Uh, the larger it is, the closer your approximation will be. Uh, it is, however, helpful <laughs> in terms of implementation if um, the number of processes, or if it's divisible by the number of processes. So we suggest 840 as a good starting place, because conveniently that's divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, you should get the same answer, more or less. Um, independent of the number of processes. 
Uh, it should depend mainly on n. Uh, one thing to note for um, C programmers like me is that the summation goes from one, not zero, it goes from one. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, it includes n. Um, so it's not from, it's less than n, it's from one to uh, less than or equal to n. Um, ideally, you want to make sure that um, it doesn't matter. Also, you should be able to run the same code for any number of processes. Um, so you may have to think a little bit about that. Remember that they're all running the same code and you fork it. So you don't need to have separate um, values of, of pi uh, or separate variable names for each process. They can all just use pi or partial pi um, for their bit. Um, you probably want to break up the iterations amongst each process. Um, okay, and we strongly recommend just using ssend MPI receive. Uh, and the final bit is about MPI W time, so I'll go back to uh, this as well. So if you, if you get that far, there is, um, oh, you can also try and make it so that the number does not need to be, so that the number of um, processes does not need to be an even divisor. And it's not simpler than you might think. Um, basically, just involves doing it, having a slightly imbalanced load. Um, but so it's up to you how, how, how much time you want to, to spend on it. Um, if you get it that far, does it really ask you to time it? Um, and it's important for the ping pong exercise. Uh, MPI helpfully just gives you a timing function. Um, returns the time in seconds as a double precision, which is great uh, if you've ever had to deal with um, <laughs> clock monotonic <laughs> uh, and all that that business in C. It is very handy just to have MPIW time available to you. <clears throat> um, and it gives you, it's, it's a W time, it's a wall clock time, so it's just seconds, which is nice. Um, okay, uh, if you have any problems with that, uh, as ever, just feel free to get in contact and I'll see what I can do. Okay, so then, uh, next lecture, we will be talking about modes, tags, and communicators. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're going to cover an explanation of the different MPI modes in a bit more detail. Uh, it's possibly slightly superfluous at this point, but we're still going to do it. Uh, the meaning and use of message tags and a rationale for MPI communicators. Um, <clears throat> these are sort of fairly basic units of um, of MPI's uh, functionality. It's, it's useful to understand them properly and what exactly they're doing. Um, uh, in particular, the use of different communicators is not immediately obvious, um, but they are quite handy. Uh, as as always, is true with tags. Um, although tags. It, often more for asynchronous communication that becomes important um, because synchronous communication is like everything else it better be correct or uh, it's never going to work anyway so um, yes so the three modes we're discussing so far and again these are all uh, in blocking forms so it's actually next week uh, in the next lecture in fact we're going to discuss um, non-blocking communications in MPI. But for now, we're all about blocking. So these functions will not return until the buffer that you have supplied them is safe to reuse. And the send buffer can be safely reused or freed. OK, they're either. So the synchronous send has sent your message. It's taken all the data from the buffer, not taking it. It's still there, but it's copied it out of the buffer um, and sent it to the destination rank. and the destination rank has received, and then MPI send completes. Uh, so that routine will not return until then. Uh, whereas the buffered send is asynchronous, but it takes a full copy of the buffer, of the send buffer, before returning. Okay, it copies it into a buffer uh, and sends it later on um, when it's ready to be received. Okay, and it returns before the message is delivered. So it's an asynchronous communication, but it's still blocking 
because that buffer can be freed or reused. Uh, if this, we unfortunately need standard sync. So the, the MPI forum are trying to be helpful, right? Uh, so the standard send um, will either be synchronous or asynchronous, <laughs> uh, basically depending on whether or not there is enough buffer space available. Um, although it is entirely implementation dependent what that exactly means. Uh, and that also means it's machine dependent, which means that your code might run perfectly fine on your computer and crash horribly on Archer for a number of reasons. Um, so we, we never really, or indeed Cirrus. Um, so we just recommend stay away from send because um, to be honest, even the mere fact that it's not guaranteed what it will do on different platforms is enough to put me right off personally. <laughs> um, but the fact it, you know, if you're going to be sending communication, if you're going to be communicating synchronously or asynchronously, it's better to know for sure which of those you are going to be doing. Um, so the MPI send itself is often not very helpful um, for that reason. Uh, so let's consider the, the humble S then to begin with. Um, okay, so process A uh, calls S send with some buffer X and it's sending to process B. Okay, process B does its thing for a while and then uh, and time here is meant to be running from the top to bottom. Uh, so it's running some other non MPI code. Um, during this time, process A is just waiting around. Okay, it's still sitting in S end. Yeah, um, because it's synchronous. Process B posts its receive. It says, okay, I'm expecting a message from, from process A. Please put it into buffer Y. Uh, the data is transferred as if by magic through the network. Um, okay, then S send returns and receive returns. So the two processes are synchronized at this point, and then they continue about their day and will most likely become desynchronized once again. But on that one moment in time, they're both existing from the send and receive function. Okay. It's nice to you know exactly what's happening. Um, and if your code works correctly with S sends, your code is correct. Uh, after that point, because it's they're both blocking, um, because it's blocking send, X can now be overwritten by A, it can reuse it or it can free it, um, delete it, whatever. Um, and Y is safe to be read by process B because the receive is always blocking. Um, for now. <laughs> Probably the receive is always blocking actually, even if you're doing asynchronous things. Um, but it's for next week. Um, the point is that once receive exits, Y is safe to read. It's been completely filled. Okay, now the buffered send. So what's going to happen here? Process A is doing its thing and it calls B send. Okay, uh, okay. again, message for process B from buffer X. Uh, meanwhile, process B is going about doing whatever. Uh, what process A is going to do because there's no receiver already on process B, it's just going to copy uh, X into a buffer space, uh, so into a different bit of memory, um, and then carry on. So this means that the variable X can now be overwritten by A or it can be freed. Uh, the developer is free to do whatever they like with it. Um, it's safe, which is nice. Okay. And it's immediately returned, so process A just carries on. Okay, meanwhile, on process B, process B now finally posts a receive. Um, it receives into buffer Y from process A. Okay, the data is transferred, the receive returns, and the buffer space is freed again uh, over on process A uh, and can be reused. Um, so if, if the receive had been posted before the buffered send as well, then that transfer would have just taken place straight away. Um, you know, it's not going to copy into the buffer if it does a receive waiting. It will just uh, go as well. Um, 
but in this situation where the receive hasn't yet been posted and you know synchronization between processes which is only guaranteed at synchronous communications and um, so anything could be happening um, so if the BSEM is called first it would just copy that out and say okay you can reuse that buffer um, but it will just be sitting still on process A so an obvious issue with this is that uh, it means you're taking copies all the time of, of things that you are sending um, and MPI requires if you're going to do this that you attach so if you use a BSEM tool you should do call sign of MPI buffer attach first okay um, with a memory address um, of some allocated space uh, that you also need to remember to detach later on. Okay, or is it with a memory address? Okay, I've got for attach. Uh, yes, okay, so you tell it the size in bytes um, and the initial address. Okay. Um, Okay, and that buffer space had better be large enough <laughs> for all of the BSENs that might end up in it. Now, how many might end up in it uh, depends entirely on your code and uh, may not be easily predictable. In particular, um, you might write some code that uses BSENs and runs perfectly well on, say, our laptop. Um, but you know, dies on something like Archer or Cirrus, not necessarily because you haven't allocated. Well, um, not because there's not enough memory on those machines in general, but because if you're scaling up your code to run on more processes, as you presumably would be, uh, unless you have very large laptops, um, there will naturally be more communications. Okay. Um, because there are more other processes to communicate with. And that means that what was a large enough buffer um, over a much smaller communication network is no longer large enough. Um, it's also to an extent machine dependent. Uh, if you're to, well, looking at the standard send, so what standard send does is it makes use of some default buffer that MPI provides, but that's implementation dependent and machine dependent. Um, in fact, I'll be talking about that next. Okay, so what can I be? Yeah, okay, so standard sends went in there, um, but the standard send, you don't need to use a buffer attach uh, because there is a small default buffer, um, but it will vary from machine to machine. Um, and the standard send will act as a synchronous send if the buffer is not large enough. Okay, but you don't know what that buffer size is. Uh, and it changes from machine to machine, as does the scaling of your code, uh, presumably. Um, so it's all just a bad idea. Just use SNs. <laughs> when it comes to blocking communications, just use SNs. Because in terms of creating overlap between communication and computation, the non-blocking SNs um, provide a much safer and much more usable way of doing that than the BSEN does. Okay, that also does not involve you having to um, take a copy of your data all the time. Um, so that's a much better approach to doing asynchronous communication than using buffered send. Um, because in buffered send, you're always going to be doubling up your memory usage. Um, okay, and here it says, uh, so the, where does the buffer space come from? The user provides it. Um, it's difficult to know ahead of time. There are situations when you will. Uh, you might be able to completely, completely gauge it, and everything will be okay. Uh, in that case, fine. Um, but as a general rule, it's best not to. And indeed, as well, if you're writing code from scratch for the first time, um, it's better to start with it being synchronous because then you know that all your receives and your sends line up and are correct. If the code functions correctly as a synchronous code, then you can start thinking about how you can make it synchronous 
to, to get all the lap of computation and communication and make it more efficient. Um, but at least you have that working version that is absolutely right. Um, so it's a nice baseline to begin with um, compared to the MPI send where you don't know what's happening or the buffered send um, where it may be correct, but uh, poorly designed code. Um, you know, if you're, your season sends are out of order and it's working because they're buffered sends, you know, you can just change the order <laughs> um, and it will be more efficient. Uh, the receive is always synchronous. Um, yeah, so, you know, process B would have waited until the send. Yes, yeah, B send will, uh, not just B send will fail, but MPI will abort uh, if you overflow an attached buffer. Um, yeah. So, the, it, so we will only try and copy into the buffer in the first place if it can't send. Um, but yeah, it will never, it will never just become a, a blocking. Um, so, so it is always blocking call. Um, it will never just become a synchronous. That's true. Hmm. Yeah, it will only. Um, so, if the receiver's already been posted, it will just send straight away, and then it's kind of like a synchronous operation. Uh, but it's just because the receive happens to have already been posted, uh, and if it can be right, it will do that. Um, but there's no way to necessarily guarantee that. Um, and if it, if there isn't a receive waiting for it, then yes, it will just take a copy. And if the buffer's full, then uh, it will fail and MPI will abort, uh, which is very undesirable behavior. <laughs> um, it's not able to simply say, okay, I'll just wait. Um, because it is a strictly asynchronous function as defined in the MPI standard. Um, I think even so, even if it did uh, do it, so Chris has suggested, um, you know, what if B send blocked until something had been removed from the buffer? I think even if it could do that instead, I don't know if that would really be desirable behavior um, because it has the same issue of, of a standard send in that you don't really know what's going to happen on any given machine uh, or for any given run of the code. Um, You know, so unless you're running always on exactly the same number of processes on exactly the same machine, um, how your kind of data size and stuff are fixed all the time, uh, it's not really reproducible, um, which isn't nice. Um, and indeed, you could deadlock. Uh, so you can write code that should deadlock but doesn't because they, you know, they're asynchronous. Uh, sends, but then if it did what you're suggesting, it would then deadlock. Um, if it suddenly switched to a synchronous mode, as indeed the standard send does. Uh, right, yeah, so Chris has said that makes sense. There's no reason for it to try to handle the situation rather than simply forcing you to provide the right size buffer, and that's correct. Um, because, you know, other sending modes are available. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you really want to go down this route, then um, the MPI position is okay. Do it right. Yeah. Okay. Ah, here we go. Here's, here's, here's we um, talk some smack about MPI send. <laughs> uh, so S send runs the risk of deadlock only. It's not really a risk if your code is correct. Um, uh, so ABLAT's is saying, does B send work without issuing an MPI buffer attach? Uh, that's sort of implementation dependent. It might do if the implementation defines a default buffer size. Um, it may not give you any way of finding out how big that is. Uh, it's in general, I would expect it not to. I would expect it simply to, to either not compile or fail. Um, if there wasn't a buffer. Um, 
uh, attached. Um, oh, another point about so if you are using vSENS, um, it's not the case that you so there's an MPI buffer detach. Um, then uh, there's an MPI buffer detach. You must also call. Um, you don't do buffer attach, vSend, buffer detach. It's you attach it at the start of your code and detach it at the end. Uh, Save so us the saying that uh, vSend works without issuing a buffer, buffer attach uh, with Pi. Is that with the Pi example or with a Raspberry Pi? Um, ah, with the example. Okay. So it's probably that will be using HP's MIT implementation. So they're clearly providing some default buffer. Um, and so I think in that, yeah, you're sending at double. So um, eight bytes, and I can see that that's probably in the realm of the sort of default buffer space. Okay, fair enough. So yes, I mean it can, you know, it can work fine, <laughs> uh, but that's dependent on both the machine and on the MPI library that you happen to be using, um, what that size is, and it's not necessarily scalable because, as I say, when you scale up your code onto many more processes. There are likely many more communications happening than when you are using less processes, and that means it's more likely that you'll start filing more and more messages into the buffer space. Um, and then you get this difficult to debug, especially if you use vSENDs in multiple places throughout your code. You get this difficult to debug failure where one rank has filled its buffer space. So the question is on which send and why, and that's dependent on the state of the network. Which is not easy to capture, um, so we we recommend SNs. <laughs> um, okay, and send. Uh, so the SN runs a risk of deadlock. That's only a risk if you're if you you know you can always mitigate that risk by having your receives be in the right order, uh, except in certain specific use cases where um uh, like task farm type things. When actually you don't know who's going to be communicating precisely when. Um, VSEN is less like dead, deadlock, uh, but you have to supply buffer space and it will fail if the buffering is exhausted. And as we'll discover next week, better options are available for asynchronous communication. Um, MPI SEN tries to solve the problem by. Uh, you know, just doing the right thing, except actually that's not very helpful um, because you can end up in a situation where it can't do either of those things and then it will fail. Uh, okay, so yeah, it could cause your problem, program to deadlock if buffering runs out. Um, so if it finds the buffer's full, it will just sit and wait. Uh, as Chris suggested, be some that we able to do. Um, okay. And you know, that's when you find out that one of your receives is in the wrong order, or one of your tags is incorrect, and so you're sitting staring at a deadlocked program uh, that worked fine before, uh, which is difficult to debug. So, S send is the way to go. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so here's an example of some code that may or may not work. Um, yeah. Uh, however, so one difficulty then with SNs is that, I mean, for a single point to point communication, it's fine. Um, but having to, to pair up all of your communications is not necessarily sustainable or scalable. Um, okay. So in that case, uh, tags can be a good way to actually uh, make sure that messages are matched correctly um, without you explicitly having to pair up sends and receives to make sure that they always happen in the correct order as well. Um, but for the more general solution, we can use non-blocking communications, which we'll talk about next week. Um, yeah. Uh, I was not joking earlier when I said that this lecture will mostly be about reasons not to use <laughs> PSEND or, or SEND. Um, yeah, 
But for simple examples like the ping pong, you can just make sure that the sends and receives match each other to make a send work okay. And you the um, the pi example. That's the one I'm looking for. Okay, so MPI does allow you to check if any messages have arrived uh, with something called MPI probe. Uh, it's the same syntax as a receive, uh, except there's no buffer. Because uh, this isn't saying, okay, you received this message. It's saying, okay, I think there might be a message for me. Can you just check? Uh, okay, and if that, again, the status is set. So you can you can check the set uh, status to find out what the size is and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if indeed there is a message waiting for you, then you can post a receive to get it. Uh, obviously, this is more useful again for the kind of situation where you're not the communication pattern is not fixed. Um, you're not necessarily sure when things will or won't be arriving. Uh, do be careful with wildcards. Uh, <laughs> you see, you have to use a specific source in order to receive uh, in the receive to guarantee matching the same message. So you have to get that source from the status. Okay. Um, Because MPI probe can take a look, see there's a message, but if there's more than one message, uh, it'll only pick up the first one in, um, or the one that matches your tag. Uh, so your MPI receive should then make sure it's definitely looking at the same message. Um, yeah, assuming you want to know exactly what it is. Okay. Every message can have a tag. Uh, it's non-negative. There is an actual maximum value. Um, so one thing that's useful for debugging, uh, for example, is to set the rank as the tag, or the, the rank of the sender as the tag for every message. Um, because, OK, when something goes wrong, you can say, OK, what was, it, what was the tag on this message? Um, however, be aware that that's not a scalable approach because there is a maximum value for the tag. Um, Okay, it needs to be at least 32,767. Apparently on Archer, it's uh, around 100,000 or so, uh, I think, something like that. Um, so it'll also be quite large, but it's not infinite. Okay, so uh, do be, just do be careful about that. Um, often it is set to zero, um, but it can be useful if you want to only receive messages of a certain tag at a certain point. Um, this can be useful when you have multiple messages incoming from the same source. And you're not sure exactly when, but you do need the receives obviously to be um, to happen in a certain order, so you know what buffer to put them in. Um, you can do that just with tags. And um, okay, yeah, you can also just use wildcards and check the status for the actual tag value. Um, that's also fine. And indeed, that's how you would do this thing of just receiving um, into the right buffer. OK. Communicators. So, so far, we've only looked at MPI Com World. It's the um, problem that's always guaranteed to be there, provided by MPI with the, the name MPI Com World. Uh, there's also MPI Com Self, which is um, arguably less useful. <laughs> that just contains one process. It's the process that uh, it's running on. Um, there are good reasons to do communications uh, with yourself at times. Um, maybe. Might help you write more general code. Um, but that's quite niche, I suspect. Uh, generally, if you just use MPI Com World, uh, one situation in which you should definitely not just use MPI Com World is if you are writing a library. Um, the reason being, uh, if you're writing a library, you want to be very careful that your MPI messages. Uh, Mark is asking why you would check for messages with MPI Probe. Um, the answer is because, again, it could be this kind of collect. Um, 
better. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, okay, so some sort of task farm uh, type pattern. Uh, and in that case, you're not exactly sure when you will be receiving a message. Um, so the only thing you can do is probe for a message. And if there is a message there, it will tell you, give you enough information about it to allocate the right space um, or to put it in the right buffer. Um, so it, it's for communications patterns that are a lot less fixed um, than we often find in scientific uh, codes, um, where usually it will just be something like a halo swap um, or domain decomposition or very like rigid communication patterns. Um, that's not always the case. And in, there it can be useful to say, okay, is there a message um, coming in? And it, so it is blocking as well, right? So it will just wait until there is something, but it will give you the information about what exactly that is. Uh, I can't find, it wasn't that far back, here we go, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, you know something should be coming, but, uh, and you know where from, but you don't know what exactly that message would be. Um, it can also be uh, if you don't want to do the thing I mentioned earlier about just creating a receive buffer that is large enough, uh, you can use MPI Pro to get information about how big a specific message is uh, and then allocate a buffer um, to receive it into. And that saves you having to just create a quote unquote large enough buffer. So there might also be situations where you know you have dynamically sized things flying around um, and this can help alleviate pain in that situation. It's, it's certainly a more advanced um, way to use MPI than really what we'll be considering in this course. Um, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. Let me just check here. I'm actually fairly sure that uh, MPI probe is synchronous and that it will just wait like a receive um, for something. Yeah, so there is a separate uh, non-blocking probe routine. Um, so MPI probe is is the is a synchronous one. Um, you know, it will wait, but it won't do the actual receive part. It will just find out the metadata about the message that's coming in. Uh, communicators. So. As we noted earlier, all communications require to provide some sort of communicator, um, which is fundamentally just a group of processes, right? And in no particular order um, in general, okay? So the ranks are not assigned um, based on anything in particular. They're just sort of divvied out. Uh, an MPI com world always exists. Um, and a message can only be received from within the same communicator from which it was sent. It is not possible to wildcard or come. However, you can create new communicators um, that contain just specific ranks. Uh, each process is given a new rank within, a, within each sub communicator. And again, they're always ordered starting from index row. Um, okay, so. Rank zero is guaranteed to exist in any communicator um, because the minimum communicator size is one. Now, this is useful if you're writing a library because it guarantees that so if you create your own communicator for just your library, you can guarantee that your MPI messages will not interact with the user's MPI messages. Um, okay, and that's important because the last thing you want to do is start accidentally uh, receiving um, MPI messages that the user is trying to send for their own code uh, in receive calls in your uh, library, <laughs> where you'll have some fairly upset users um, as they're trying to debug what's going on. And it turns out all their messages are being swallowed uh, by your library code. Um, there are other uh, uses for creating different communicators. Um, so you can attempt to do a similar sort of splitting based on something on tags. Um, so you can say, okay, if I if my rank is even, um, 
I will use this tag. If my rank is old, I will use this tag. Um, there's one way to do it. Uh, but the MPI communicator split guarantees that no messages will pass between those different groups of processes. Okay. Uh, so does MPI com split? We'll let you divide MPI com world up. Uh, no, nope, MPI com world still exists. Um, and there's no way to remove MPI com world, right? MPI com world is always guaranteed to exist. Uh, Alison, uh, so that's a question from Marta asking if um, when MPI com world is split into sub communicators, does MPI com world still exist? Uh, it does. Uh, Alessandro is asking uh, when splitting do they preserve the original relative order? The answer is uh, maybe, but not necessarily. Uh, you can actually, uh, yes, I can sketch. Uh, so, if I look up MPI com split. So, what's missing here is the call signature. Uh, I think it's coming up actually. Hopefully, it is. Uh, but there is there's a thing called a key that you can provide to the um, MPI com split that will determine that. Okay, so you can actually say uh, you have some say over what rank. You know, the, or what the new rank is, um, but it's probably that will be what happens. But it's implementation dependent; it's not in the MPI standard. Um, so the way that the standard is written is often to give a lot of freedom to implementers, uh, you know, to optimize things if they want or to change things. Uh, it's to give them some flexibility to you know create a better MPI library and it still complies with the standard. Um, so often, kind of really detailed things like that are not defined um, how that should happen. However, often common sense is, is the common sense solution is the one that is chosen. Uh, Mart is asking uh, if uh, so. That means every processor can belong to a few communicators. Uh, yes. Yeah. So there's nothing um, to stop any one process being. The process can be in multiple communicators. It will not necessarily have the same rank in those communicators, but it can be involved in several. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting that you know the having many many communicators is not a pattern that MPI expects you to use. So the the idea is there might be several communicators, and not there will be thousands of communicators. Um, so yeah, the MPI standard says that these things to control the communicators should exist, um, but it doesn't say that they have to be particularly efficient or fast, um, because you know you're expecting it to happen a few times near the start of the code, probably just to set everything up. Um, you wouldn't want to do so. One, I say, common pattern in scientific codes is a, a domain decomposition where there's a halo swap, so um, you have some grid or some array. I uh, need to divide it up amongst the processes, and then processes need to communicate with their nearest neighbors, uh, the boundary conditions. Um, okay, you would not create a communicator for every process that had all its neighbors in, um, because that would not be a scalable approach, because it would require you to potentially create many thousands of, of processes, uh, of communicators. So um, that is not the way to go there. Uh, on the other hand, if you have two very like discrete um, sets of tasks that need completing, uh, you might simply split your MPI com world in two um, and say, okay, communicator one is going to do this, communicator two, or communicator zero, I should say, zero, <laughs> is going to do this, communicator one is going to do this, um, and, and split things up that way. But you have to be sure that they never have to communicate with one another. Um, although they can still do that through com world, um, but that will be based on their their com world rank, not on their sub communicator ranks. Uh, if that all makes sense. Okay. Um, so you can also make a copy of MPI com world uh, through the MPI com dupe routine. Uh, it contains all the same processes, but in a new communicator, 
why is that useful? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you're making a library, it's a very good idea <laughs> to make sure that your communications are absolutely separate from the end users. Um, but simply duplicating Comworld uh, is a very simple way of making sure you still have access to every process that's been launched. Um, but in a way that you're not going to uh, trample over the end users' messages. And nor can you know the user intercept your library messages, so it's just a much cleaner, much safer. Um, so you can, you, you could, you might think, okay, well, I'll just set my tag to be like uh, 117,000 and three. No one else is going to ever use that, so that'll be fine. But because um, tag wildcarding exists, um, you know, that can cause you problems. Uh, in fact, I've written, <laughs> I've spent a day or two in the past uh, debugging code that, as it turned out, the issue was um, the sort of library routines were using uh, a special tag to identify themselves rather than a different communicator. Uh, and my MPI any tag receives was swallowing those up, uh, and everything was going very wrong. And it was a absolute pain. <laughs> so uh, don't do that. Uh, just use a different communicator. Um, okay. So you know why? Why should we bother with all these send modes? Um, I mean, as, uh, hopefully I've, I've pointed out basically with anything but send don't. Um, the the non-blocking routines are different. They are much more useful. Uh, we'll discuss those next week. Um, those are how we suggest you should do asynchronous communications, um, because basically they don't guarantee that the buffer is, is reusable when they exit, but they do provide a way for you testing whether or not it's happened. Um, so it kind of gives you the best of both worlds, um, because you're not copying the data. Okay, you're basically just starting the sending process in the background, um, and then you can be sure when it has completed, unlike with the beast end, when you just assume that it has at some point. Um, the standard send is also not helpful because it has the same, essentially the same drawbacks as the beast end, uh, and also might deadlock. So um, it actually gives you the worst of both worlds. Um, S end is safe. S end will give you correct codes, and should always be your starting point, if nothing else. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what are tags for? Uh, potentially nothing at all, just set them all to zero. Uh, that's better than wildcarding because it's more efficient because your receive isn't you know, checking um, for whatever's coming first. Uh, and you'll have to check what the actual tag was. Um, so from the implementation side, it's a little bit quicker because it doesn't have to expand to all the potential tags that there might be. Um, it just says, OK, I'm looking for something with a tag zero. Uh, however, it can also be for debugging. Do be a bit careful with that. If you're running a very large job, that might break uh, because there is an upper limit on the size. Um, can I just use MPI com world? Yes, yeah, you probably will. Uh, there's a good chance you'll never need to create new communicators. Um, okay, uh, it's probably bad practice to specify in kind of com world everywhere, just in case you do need to change it later on. Uh, in much the same way that hard coding any value is a potentially bad idea. Um, so you know, it's always potentially a good idea to create a, a variable instead uh, that just is equal to MPI com world but could be changed. Um, <clears throat> one case in which you and there are another case in which creating communicators is useful, is there is actually an MPI concept of a communicator topology. Um, so I don't believe, let's have a quick look at the schedule. No, so we're not going to come on to it in this course, but um, you can do something called, well, you can create something called a Cartesian communicator, for example. Um, and all it really does, because the MPI ranks are just I know, numbers arbitrarily assigned to each process. If you create a Cartesian communicator, uh, you can tell it 
well, actually, uh, my processes are going to correspond to different parts of a 2D grid, for example, or a 3D array. Um, you know, because I'm doing a domain decomposition. Uh, and then it will also provide a way of you checking your neighbors. So you can do that yourself um, uh, simply by, you know, doing a bit of integer arithmetic um, based on the size of the array, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, uh, MPI provides a convenience function for you to do that. <laughs> if you told it, you know, this is how they're going to be laid out. In theory, it also lets the implementation do something a bit smarter underneath. So you can tell it that you're happy for it to uh, when you're tracing the Cartesian communicator, you, know, you can say, you know, if you need to change the ranks around, go for it. Uh, and what it can do then is make sure that ranks that happen to be um, nearest neighbors are actually physically located near one another as well. So try and put them on the same node um, or the same board or whatever. Uh, it doesn't have to do that, right? There's no guarantee, but it is at least a possibility if you give it that information. Uh, and that's another sort of pattern that MPI as a standard follows is it uh, likes to create ways for the user to provide useful information to the implementer. Um, so actually, this is what I'm going to be doing. So, um, you know, please make this as efficient as possible. Um, and that helps uh, the implementers a lot. Um, but so that's, that's probably the most common reason for users to create their own communicators is because they're specifying something about a topology um, that says, okay, I actually want these processes to be uh, considered as next to one hour. Um, there we go, that's, that's a bit of a, a diversion. Um, ah, and that's us. So, uh, as I arrived, I've spoken far too quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, oh, so uh, Ivars is asking about a send receive command. Oh, okay, um, that's another one on the uh, just don't. <laughs> Just on this, so send receive. There's actually so there's another mode as well, which we've also ignored, called a ready send, which is um, best. The less said about that, the better. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just looking at the send receive now, so I get this right. So the, the send receive uh, is basically a buffer swap type operation. Um, yeah, so it combines. Uh, it combines the sending and receiving into one single uh, call, um, which is MPI send receive. And the point is that you send from the buffer and then expect another, well, the destination rank to have also called MPI send receive. So it's a synchronous, um, a synchronous call. Uh, and basically, whatever is in the destination ranks send or send receive buffer will be received at your end. Uh, and vice versa. So it swaps the two. Um, so it is equivalent to doing something like send on process A, receive on process B, uh, followed immediately by uh, an F send on process B and a receive on process A. It can uh, it can work great, um, but you know, you just have to be a little bit careful with it. It is a synchronous operation. Um, but for that, you know, it, it's for a certain specific use case, and it, it can do that well. It's the kind of thing as well where you, it's something you might want to introduce once you've already got a working version of the code, and you notice, okay, this is always just swapping pretty much the same thing. It's not, I wouldn't recommend it as something to, to start out with, if that makes sense, because um, think of it as like, an optimization almost. So you know, never never make that your first version, but you might see, okay, this could just be done with a send receive and that might be better. Um, however, it's best to, to write it with simple synchronous sends first and then you know good. Uh, so Mark is asking about uh, message order preservation. Uh, 
Oh, so, so they call two B sends. They land in the buffer in the right order and wait for the receiver to receive. And, but if a receiver with any tag comes, it is the order. Uh, yes, that's exactly right, Marshall. So, um, so if if there's no if there's some sort of wildcarding in effect, and I think. So let me just go back to my slides. I think that's where was it? Here we go. So this this was this situation, I think. Um, that you're talking about, and yes, in that in that situation, precisely what will happen is that it will be the order that detects uh, which um, which buffer which message ends up in because they're both wildcarded with any tag. Uh, so the a dangerous thing here might be that if you have an MPI any tag, okay, it's going to receive tag equals one first because that was the first one sent. Fine. If that second receiver, instead of having MPI any tag, had tag equals one, you would be in trouble. <laughs> that code would deadlock. Um, so I guess one thing that's important above all else is to be consistent uh, when you're doing this kind of thing as well. Uh, you know, if you've chosen to do it a certain way, then make sure you stick to that, uh, or you might get yourself uh, into a deadlock situation. Um, but if you're using uh, wildcarding like this as well, you can check status. To find out what the actual tag value um, received is, which may be important uh, in terms of determining what exactly you're expecting to find in in a given buffer. <laughs> so I was saying, so in a way, the messages can overtake. Uh, you can receive them in a different order, yes, but they haven't overtaken one another in the network. Okay. <laughs> yes, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. The the point is that the MPI guarantees that once they're off node, right, then then the the order is fixed. Yes, okay, because what Bsend actually does is copy it into a buffer as well, then yes. Um they haven't really overtaken one another because the first one hasn't been sent. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I see what you mean. So just to go back to an earlier question as well, I'm just looking at a um, uh, documentation file for MPI probe, and it says here that yep, it is a blocking call that returns only after a matching message has been found. Um, there is an asynchronous alternative. Uh, Chris Stewart is asking, do I have any recommendations on how to get started? Developing and running MPI software on your own machine. Uh, for example, choosing which MPI implementation and versions to use. Any good lot online guys and how to set them on a full MPI cluster. Um, so actually, that's a lot easier than you might be expecting. It depends a little bit on your um, what your computer is. So I mean, one thing is that, uh, as is often the case uh, for these sorts of development tools, um, your life will be a lot easier if you choose to do your development um, on a Linux machine or on a virtual machine that is running some kind of Linux. Because then you can uh, simply install from your friendly local repository um, OpenMPI. Uh, so op OpenMPI is, is probably the go-to for this sort of um, local things. Um, because a lot of the other ones are either commercial, so you have to you have to pay for them, <laughs> um, or very specific to certain types of hardware. Uh, OpenMPI is a more experimental um, library, but it is still um, you know it has a stable version. So OpenMPI is, is the obvious choice for simply installing on a, a local cluster or even on your own computer. Um, on that note. So actually, you can launch any number of processes on uh, on any computer, with the exception that you know Sirius has specific things in there to stop you doing that. <laughs> but you know, if someone hasn't done that, then you can do whatever you like. So uh, you can merrily run uh, did and do often for uh, testing purposes, run say four MPI processes on a two-core VM uh, on my laptop. Uh, that's not a problem at all. Um, Chris is also asking on OpenMPI, uh, 
they see that in their friendly local package repository, they have a choice in OpenMPI and OpenMPI3. Is there any reason not to use the recent version? Uh, no, no, there's not. There's not. Um, so MPI, you know, is a standard, right? And the process is not. So yes, there are more experimental implementations, um, but the things that make it into the standard are very carefully vetted and very heavily debated often. Um, so you're unlikely, uh, unless you're using a specific experimental or development branch of the, the implementation um, to run across stuff that doesn't. Um, and I can't see any particular reason why you would. So I don't I don't know off the top of my head what the difference is between MPI 2 point whatever and uh, 3R. Um, but all of the stuff that we've talked about so far in these courses will certainly work fine in MPI 3. And there'll be some new and exciting things in there too. So MPICH, M-P-I-C-H, is another sort of uh, standard um, MPI implementation. MPICH is a little bit special because they are funded by the US government to maintain a stable and efficient MPI uh, library. Um, so, uh, <laughs> OK, this is a somewhat esoteric uh, analogy, but it's a bit like uh, Debian versus Ubuntu, <laughs> um, looking at MPitch versus OpenMPI. Um, one is more focused on stability and, and long term. Um, uh, one is more likely to have newer things in it, um, and maybe a bit less stable, but still basically works. Um, both are free. <laughs> There is, so we say on just looking at our own, uh, yep, so there, there is a, a version of MPI for Windows. Um, I can't say I've ever tried it. Hmm. Just looking at it now. Um, so I'm a little bit um, dubious, mostly just because I know that C support is not. Um, Great on Windows because they, they would really rather than when you use C++ and obviously MPI itself just uses um, or doesn't have a supported C++ interface anymore. Um, but I see no reason why that wouldn't work if you are a Windows developer. Um, but I would imagine that's your choice in terms of free implementations uh, of MPI on Windows. Um, by its nature, because it's designed for distributed computing, uh, it's more of interest to supercomputing centers who um, are unlikely to want to fork out for a uh, Windows Server license. <laughs> um, so, you know, Linux is better supported. Apple, I think, uh, same thing uh, for as is Linux, you can just get OpenMPI probably. Um, as always, with my waffling, I've managed to go slightly over time. Apologies for that. Uh, if you do have any more questions, feel free to just email me, uh, if we have any, or if you have any problems with the exercises. Um, otherwise, I will see you next week um, when we will be a going through the uh, well. We have we'll have another quiz on Socrative and um, talk about solutions to calculating pi. And we'll be discussing non-blocking communication, sort of carrot that I've been dangling quite a lot today as a better way of doing asynchronous than B-Send. Um, until then, have a good week, and goodbye from me.